Welcome to the Nathan Nephew Show. I am Nathan Nephew. As always, and I kind of feel like I repeat myself here, it's a little redundant, but there's a lot, a lot to talk about. We've got Obamacare debacles. We've got a police chief threatening to find people that post on his Facebook page. Oh, man. We've got all sorts of things. I, uh... I might even consider playing some old clips of our president making promises that we've, well, we've now found out that he knew weren't true when he made them. NathanNephew.com, talk at NathanNephew.com. You want to send me an email, you can find me on Facebook as well. I want to start out, though, as always, with the, oh, again, repeating myself, but I think one of the most important documents ever written uh, and definitely put into use in this country, and that's the Constitution of the United States. We are on the executive branch now, Article 2, Section 2. The President shall be the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices, and he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. So, we hear the president called commander-in-chief. The, the, uh, that's a pretty common term used. We know that kind of means that he's ultimately in charge of the army, the military, the army, and the navy, and also the military of the several states. So each individual individual state's military, but only only when they are called into service of the United States. So if the federal government calls up the state military, which they can, the state militia, then the president becomes the commander-in-chief of those. He can also require, not ask for, require the opinion in writing of the officer of each executive department. So when he says... Kathleen Sebelius, what's HHS doing? She is then required by Constitution to respond in writing. Uh, and, and more so, not really what they're doing, more so. Well, what's your opinion on this healthcare website? Should we hire a company that was fired for not doing well uh, by a foreign nation, or what do you think? Also, the president has the power to grant reprieves and pardons uh, in cases uh, other than impeachment, so... We see presidents give pardons usually on their way out of office. Uh, you know, that's what one of their last things they do. So then they don't have to worry about re-election or anything like that. So uh, if you need a pardon, you're going to want to think about the timing and make sure that that you, uh, you get that hooked up uh, at the end of a president's term or second term if, you know, unless they're not running again. He, the president, shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of senators present concur. Okay. So he can make treaties with other nations or whatever it is, but two-thirds of the Senate, of, of senators present, not the entire Senate, just the senators present at the time must agree. So the small arms treaty, if that's a real treaty, and I haven't done that much research, but president can sign it, but the United States is under no obligation to that treaty until two-thirds of the Senate concur that they would like to be restricted by that. And luckily for the Small Arms Treaty, Senate did not do that. It goes on, and he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for and which shall be established by law. But Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. So 
a new Supreme Court justice is needed because one retires or dies, the president makes an appointment. He needs the advice and consent of the Senate for that appointment to take effect. Now, unlike treaties, the Constitution does not mandate that two-thirds of the Senate agree. The Senate essentially can make up their own determination of what advice and consent means, and there is some disagreement with that. Uh, This is one of the areas where I differ from somebody like Rand Paul, who thinks this has advice and consent. It means he has to give advice and consent to any appointment. Completely, completely disagree with that. Uh, There's no reason that the Senate has to it does not say that the senate must consent what's the point if the senate must give consent to every appointment that the president makes that doesn't really it doesn't really jive with uh you know the wording here and especially the wording on treaties that that are uh, i don't think the intention the intent of this clause was to force the senate to give consent to any appointment that the president makes Now, the next clause in Article 2, Section 2, is one that we've seen come up quite a bit with this president and with other presidents, of course, but this president's done it a lot and it's went to court. The president shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commission, which shall expire at the end of their next session. Now, these are recess appointments. And we hear about all of the recess appointments that Barack Obama made when they're on like, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're off two days on vacation. Oh, recess appointment. Let me make appointments. No, there are very specific defined times that the Senate is in recess. That is the time where a recess appointment is possible if needed. And that appointment expires at the end of the Senate's next session. What this president was doing was any time the Senate wasn't in town, doesn't matter where they are, if they're home on Monday because that's when they go visit with their constituents, he'll make a recess appointment, say, I can because the Senate's not in town. Mr. President, that is not the intent. And, well, I believe you found that out when it went to court, didn't you? All right. Um, might, as well, might as well do Article 2, Section 3 as well. He, the president, shall from time to time give to Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses or either of them, and in case of disagreement between them with respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care of the laws... Uh, take care that the laws be faithfully executed and shall commission all of the officers of the United States. So, from time to time, once a year, State of the Union address. Uh, we see it on TV, we listen to it, we get angry with it every year. Uh, let's see, what else was in here? The the executive branch is, is tasked with taking care that laws are faithfully executed. So, enforcing the laws of the United States. We see how well that goes with things like immigration and and uh, whether you agree with it or not, uh, federal drug laws, things like that, that are, are not being enforced. Uh, during the State of the Union, though, of course, we see him make, uh, you know, uh, suggestions of what he thinks should be worked on and, and, and what he thinks the Senate should do. I'll just finish up Article 2, I suppose. So Article 2, Section 4. The President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. So if your president does something like sends arms and and ammunition, uh, tanks, planes, and things to a terrorist group that is actually declared to be at war with the United States of America... That would be treason. So if the Muslim Brotherhood or somebody got armed by the President of the United States, he could be removed from office on impeachment. Hmm. I don't know if that's ever happened, but uh, uh, at least under this president, he's definitely never given money to a enemy of the United States. But I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be back. Uh, NathanNephew.com. Look me up on Facebook.
send me an email, talk at nathannephew.com. <laughs> When it comes to TV, if you can't see the difference, why pay the difference? Switch to Dish for the best value in entertainment. Not only will you find the same channels you know and love for less, Dish sweetens the deal with free HD for life and premium movie channels free for three months, including Blockbuster at home. You can also save a bundle when you combine DishNet high-speed internet with your TV service. Why would you ever pay more for TV? Switch to Dish and see what real value is. Free HD for life. Life premium channels free for three months, scores of movies with Blockbuster at home, premium savings when you bundle DishNet high speed internet service. Limited time offer, 24 month agreement with credit qualification required. Cancellation fee, auto pay, and paperless billing and other restrictions apply. Call for details. Call Dish Satellite, your Dish authorized retailer now. 800 507 9468. 800 507 9468. 800 507 9468. That's 800 507 9468. Red State Talk Radio is All-American Talk Radio. The Nathan Nephew Show. Somewhat unique. Somewhat unique? Yes, somewhat unique. All right, welcome back. I'm Nathan Nephew, as you know. I uh, Before I get into Obama's lies, I mean, and this is fairly new. Uh, the current president has never lied to the nation before, uh, you know, yesterday. So we were all surprised. I mean, everyone on the left was surprised anyway. You know, I mean, not only were they surprised when they went to sign up for Obamacare and they couldn't, or that when they finally did, or they got that letter in the mail that said your plan's been canceled. Or when they found out that their plan was, the the premium was skyrocketing. Or that their deductible was skyrocketing. And it wasn't actually $2,500 cheaper like the president had promised many, 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 many times. Or that their doctor, their doctor decided that, well, yes, he loves medicine, but he also does it for a living. So he's going to do what is the best, uh, best for him. And he's going to move to something like a, a concierge service or or something and basically just opt out of Obamacare altogether. Uh, and that surprises them on the left. And, and they're finally CBS, you know, um, Politico, some of these some of these other uh, uh, ABC news starting to kind of turn. I don't think MSNBC has quite turned yet, but, you know, that takes a while. I, I mean, they make some mention of things, but. When when these news organizations start to turn on on such a liberal socialist president like like Barack Hussein Obama, you have to be really careful. And you have to pay attention because what 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 I've noticed in the past is it's kind of cyclical. The, the Barack Obama needs some help, so the liberal media helps him out as much as they can. They spread all of the lies, the misinformation the rhetoric, everything, as much as they can, and then their ratings plummet because Americans in general want the truth. And it, admittedly, it takes some Americans longer than others to get to, to, to realize what the truth is and to understand, understand that mainstream media may not necessarily be telling you the 100% truth the first time around. But then when their ratings plummet, they decide, oh, we better we better do something. So they appear to be turning, they appear to actually be vetting the president that's been president for five years, should have been vetted six, seven years ago. They appear like they're actually going to do some reporting. You get sucked in, the ratings start to go back up, and then they turn right back around and start helping the president with his agenda again. This time, this time though, the lies have hit home. And I'm not saying that we can we can completely fall in bed with the liberal media now, but this time these anchors and some of the reporters, their personal family health insurance plans are being impacted. They are not getting better. They are not getting cheaper. And it, if that's if they're even able to keep them. So I want to get to this in a minute. I have a montage. I guess I can do it right now since I 
this was supposed to just be a, a little tease, and it turned into pretty much the whole story. Obama lied, and we find out. We look at the uh, the white uh, the the register, the federal government register, and we find out that in 2010, actually, the White House, which means Barack Hussein Obama or people who, that he is responsible for, knew that 60 or 70 percent of Americans would not be able to keep their plans. Or, or uh, 60, 70 percent of the the less than awesome plans defined by Obamacare and the president. Any plan that wasn't awesome enough for him, 60 to 70 percent of those plans would not be grandfathered because what they did was they wrote in a grandfather clause into Obamacare and it said, yeah, your plan that you had on March, whatever, when it was signed, our grandfathered. So a small subset of plans, the substandard plans, whatever that means. And some of those are plans that people actually liked and they were getting along just fine with their plans because they were covering what they needed because the single male, uh, you know, 30 year old male did not need coverage for birth control or coverage for, uh, pregnancy, mammograms, those sorts of things. He was happy with his substandard plan and it was supposed to be grandfathered in, but then we see that it says it's grandfathered in unless there's any change made to it at all. So if your premium goes up by, by $50, which it does regularly, if your deductible goes up by $50, which it does regularly, it's no more, it's, it's grandfathered no longer. And, oh, you have to go sign up for the exchange. And since the exchange isn't working well and no one likes it, we should probably just move to single payer. What we should do is we should just take Medicare we should just put everybody in Medicare, single payer, businesses, you know, large corporations will pay for everybody. Everyone's covered. We're all hunky dory. It's great. It's great. Utopia. But then we find out, and this is interesting because you remember the unions, Mr. Hoffa, uh, complaining about Obamacare, saying it was terrible, devastating, destructive. The unions didn't like it. But then we find out that if you got your plan via collective bargaining, if you were in a union and you got a health care plan because you are in a union, that is grandfathered, even if it's substandard. So there's two ways to look at that. First, unions essentially were exempted from losing their plans like everybody else that had a substandard plan. But two, if these plans are really substandard and the president really, really believes that these plans are not doing enough good for people and that if you have these plans that you should, they are so dangerous to your health and family that you should be forced to buy into this brilliant idea of Obamacare because we know all good ideas require a mandate. If he thinks these plans are so good then why would he exempt his best friends? Wouldn't you think he would have done the opposite, right? If getting rid of these substandard plans was so important to the individual, shouldn't he have made sure that his buddies in the union got the best plan available and that they weren't exempt from their plan being canceled because it no longer qualified under Obamacare? Wouldn't you have think he would have had the Tea Party allowed the Tea Party to keep their substandard plans so he could get rid of them because that's been his modus operandi for, as far as I can tell, his entire life. And that is to destroy the enemy. If someone's running against you in office, destroy them. Maybe not literally, but just do everything you can to damage their reputation, lie about them. It's, it's typical thuggery. I mean, it is really what it is, and that's what Obamacare has been. I want to take a listen. Uh, this is about a minute and a half long, so bear with me. But you've probably never heard the president say this, but I guess once or twice he did mention that if you had a health care plan and a doctor, which I think is more important, is that people are losing their doctors. If you had a health care plan that you like, you, in fact, you can keep it. You have nothing to worry about. I said this once or twice, but it bears repeating. And you can keep your plan if you are satisfied with it. If you like the plan you have, you can keep it. If you like your plan and you like your doctor, you won't have to do a thing. You keep your plan. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan. If you've got health insurance, you can keep it. If you like your health care plan, you will keep 
your plan. If you've got health insurance, you like your doctor, you like your plan, you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan. If you have insurance that you like, then you will be able to keep that insurance. If you like your doctor or health care plan, you can keep it. If you like your health care plan, you can he- keep your health care plan. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. If you like your private health insurance plan, you can keep your plan. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. If you like your private health insurance plan, you can keep it. If you want to keep the health insurance you got, you can keep it. If you like the insurance plan you have now, you can keep it. And if you like your insurance plan, you will keep it. So if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. If you like your plan, Keep your plan. If you like your current insurance, you will keep your current insurance. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. If you're happy with what you got, nobody's changing it. Yeah, nobody, nobody except except the federal government. Uh, we forgot about that. Nobody's going to change it uh, except this entire monstrosity called Obamacare will change it. Now, what they're saying, they're backtracking, saying, well... He's been lying for the last five years. Uh, he wasn't lying, but if you were too stupid not to just read into what he said and add words to it that say, if you like your plan and your plan is not substandard, then you can keep your plan. Because look what people, these, these substandard plans are being canceled, and these people are going on the, the Obamacare exchange and getting a better deal. You know, something that's $6,000 more expensive a year. That's better, but now it covers pregnancy for middle-aged men. How can you not love that plan? I mean, yeah, he lied. It wasn't true. You know, he's been lying out his butt for five years, but he really meant that it's just going to be better for you. The little guy. It's, It's despicable. Absolutely despicable. And impeachable? Hmm. Now I want to move on to something a little a little different. I saw <clears throat> I saw this uh Facebook post from the Columbia Police Department in South Carolina. And I hope it's real. Well, I I hope it isn't real, but it, I believe it is. The Columbia Police Department posted that it got 40k of marijuana, and I'm not sure what 40k of marijuana is exactly. They seized it from an apartment. So, one of the residents, Brandon Whitmer, responded and said, maybe you should arrest the people shooting people in five points instead of worrying about a stoner that's not bothering anyone. It'll be legal here one day anyway. Now, admittedly, maybe not the best idea to post something like that on a police department website, but but remember that First Amendment, and that gets in the way because the liberals love the First Amendment while they're using it. Now, if a conservative uses it, it, then the First Amendment is it it just leads to racism. So this guy, Brandon Whitmer, should be able to say whatever the hell he wants on this police Facebook page. But the chief, apparently, and that was confirmed, responded and said, Brandon Whitmer, we have arrested all of the violent offenders in five points. Thank you for sharing your views and giving us reasonable suspicion to believe you might be a criminal. We will work on finding you. Now, what the hell kind of threat is that? From a police chief saying, thanks for posting something on Facebook that I'm stupid enough to believe gives us reasonable suspicion that you're a criminal. Because your post says, don't bother this other guy. Why don't you go find real criminals that are actually doing harm? Because, as you know... I have a real problem with victimless crimes. If you're committing a crime and there's no harm to anybody else, why is it a crime? So that post got deleted and followed up by another post. This is Interim Chief Santiago posting. I was just notified that one of my staff members deleted my post. I put everyone on notice that if you advocate for the use of illegal substances in the city of Columbia, then it's reasonable to believe you might also be involved in that particular activity why would someone feel threatened if you are not doing anything wrong why would you care about the T- the NSA spying on you if you're not doing anything wrong why would you care about the TSA fondling your children 
if they're not doing anything wrong. Why would you care about police officers searching your apartment if you're not doing anything wrong? Apply this same concept to gang activity or gang members. You can have gang tattoos and advocate that lifestyle, but that only makes me suspicious of them. I can't do anything until they commit a crime. So feel free to express yourself, and I will continue to express myself and what we stand for. I'm always open to hearing how our citizens feel like we can be effective in fighting crime. Now, what a crock. He said, we will work on finding you. He didn't say, maybe that means you smoke marijuana. But I can't do anything about it. He said, we will work on finding you. Now, of course, they had to release a statement. Chief Santiago did write those two posts. I believe the original comment was misconstrued. I appreciate you reaching out to CPD. Chief was trying to say that he puts would-be criminals on notice. If you commit a crime or plan to commit one, CPD will work hard to investigate and press charges according to the law. It's easy for social media posts to be misunderstood. The man who was so-called threatened openly admitted that he was not offended and appreciated the work of CPD. Of course he did, because he was threatened by the police department, and he was worried that they'll come beating on his door to search his apartment, and if he has nothing to hide, why would you even worry about it? Now, you're going to tell me that this is not a threat and that this was misconstrued. We will work on finding you. Uh, Police chief, I say, why don't you work on finding and arresting violent criminals rather than worrying about a stoner that's not bothering anyone? I think that's a brilliant point, and I would like an answer. Are you going to come find me? Because I don't believe that gives you any reasonable suspicion that I have done anything wrong. And you know what? I do have things that I'd like to hide because that's my prerogative and it's my privacy and it's my family and it's none of your damn business whether I have something to hide or not. See you next week.